Welcome back to Smarter Storage for Tomorrow's Opportunities, where we're going to dive into what are the essential characteristics of storage that will help organizations manage their way through that AI data tsunami they're experiencing in a resilient, efficient, and easy to use manner. To help me unpack this, I'm joined by Jody Hoagland, who's the Global Technology Evangelist at Dell, and John Lockhausen, who's the Technical Solutions Architect with WWT. Welcome to the show, guys. Hey, Welcome. good Thank to be you here. For having us. Thanks. This segment, we're really going to be focused on intelligent infrastructure and what really drives simplicity and ease of use within that infrastructure. Before we get into the bits and bytes and the storage specific pieces of it, you know, why is this important in the age of AI? Why is simplicity and efficiency really at, at the crux of this with AI? Yeah, I, I think when you look at what's happening uh, inside of the industry with the, the speed of change and how fast things are changing, AI is, is driving uh, architectures, customers to, to adopt things at a pace. I think it's just strictly unparalleled. You know, that it's, it's unlike anything we've ever seen. That speed of change is, is driving a lot of complexity. So when customers are saying, okay, well, there's this new technology, or there's this new technology, well, how do we make all of that work and how do we bring it together? And on top of that, you know, with complexity, you, you get the re resource constraining, you know, that starts to happen. Um, yeah, I've been doing this a long time. You know, we've, we've got the different colored hair, you know, the, the battle scars, but the reality is, is that system administrators today are not necessarily what they were 20 years ago where you had dedicated storage administrators, for example. Today, you got men and women that are working in the landscape. They're, they're the, they're the network person, they're the compute person, they're the storage person. And so when you go down that stack of the pace of change of AI, driving these customers to do things faster, building in complexity, uh, as a result, trying to figure out, okay, how do we do more with less resources? You know, that, that really has an effect on IT infrastructure. Yeah, I would say there's the old thing of fast, cheap, or easy, pick two. Yeah. Customers are being asked to pick all three. Mm -hmm. Like they, they, AI is not necessarily getting new budgets, so they're having to cut from somewhere. So they need it to be, they need it to cost less. They need it to perform better because AI is driving, it's actually able to use all of the pipes that are being given to it. And nobody has the time to go get PhDs in storage anymore. What do you see that organizations are doing specifically with respect to their storage infrastructure to kind of respond to this? And what are they looking for? Uh, a lot of customers are looking for intelligence into the environments, into the data, understanding what data is doing what, what do they need to focus, what do they need to emphasize on. Uh, and on top of that, making things simple, making things very easy to use. Again, you know, having someone who has a, a PhD, you don't talk about short stroking drives anymore, right? So as we so, yeah, right. It, I'm glad. Yeah, yeah it's a it's a good thing. So so how do we take you know all of this complexity, leverage the intelligence that technology like AI brings to the table, and how do we use that to create more simplistic, easier to use environments? Uh, and I think that's that's kind of the focus is driving out the complexity. So that that really has been a theme that we've been hearing around future proofing and really how it's being built into the storage infrastructure just, you know, because a lot of people are looking at, you know, if I have future proof, maybe I have to make trade off somewhere else. We were talking and you brought up the whole, the whole concept of the stool and you can have this, but you can't have that cheap, easy, quick kind of thing. Is, is future proofing the same way? What are you seeing from, you know, your customers with that? Yeah, I would say what our customers are looking for is to not be boxed in. So maybe I start with use case A today. I buy a platform that supports that use case. Down the road, something else comes up. Hey, I can still, I'd like to be able to use my existing investment to continue to service more stuff. Uh, if I outgrow the performance capabilities of my system, I want to be able to upgrade that, preferably in place so that I'm not having to pick everything up and go through a months long migration to move it with outage windows and all the pain that comes with that. From the Dell perspective, what's being cooked into PowerStore to help with that as well? It's, it's kind of the core design concepts of PowerStore. So if you rewind the clock, you know, several years ago now, we, the product's been to life four and a half years. Uh, but I do remember the executive leadership team from Michael Dell, Jeff Clark, 
you know, talking about power store for this category of storage being the strategic future, not just for Dell Technologies, but for the industry. Uh, the reason being is because of the intelligence that we've built into the platform in and of itself. So the platform being able to, to make smart decisions on behalf of the administrator so that they're not going through these complex decision-making processes of, oh, okay, well, I need to create a volume. Do I create the volume over there? Do I create the volume over here? What if I just create the volume, right? Uh, and let the system work it out. So that's, uh, you know, focusing on the intelligence, making the intelligence simple. So just click, click, go kind of scenarios. Uh, and that, you know, basically creating a, an atmosphere to say, you know what, uh, to John's point, to, you know, hey, I'm investing in a platform that is easily upgradable, it's easily scalable, uh, it's very simple to use and manage, and I can make sure that what I'm investing in today is going to protect me, you know, two, three, four, five years down the road. The ecosystem is also changing, and there's a lot of things you have to do that, but starting at the bits and the bites of being, you know, kind of self-optimized. You know, what, what is PowerStore doing to really be focused on being self-optimized? I'll give you some design concepts, and I know John does a lot of this testing and, and validation in their ATC lab, uh, but when we focus on self-optimization self within the platform, there's some key design characteristics that goes in. So, for example, when you talk about data reduction, customers, it's a valuable thing in the all-flash space because if you can reduce it, you can save money, right? So customers want that aspect of, of saving cash. But, you know, you don't have to make decisions on do, do I turn it on, do I turn it off, do I enable it here, disable it there? It's just always on. So when you talk about the technology itself, whether it's, you know, always inline, fully hardware-assisted, Intel QAT, right? So we've got hardware offloaded capabilities where there's no performance impact, but also data placement, you know, being able to cluster, put multiple appliances together, manage them from the same pane of glass, from the same interface, being able to say, I just need to create a volume and I want that volume to land where it needs to land, right, without having to make all of these different decisions. So self-optimizing can, can go through the design principles of the stack. Uh, and there's some really cool things we can talk about on the back end, but you know, John, I know you're doing a lot of this in the ATC. How do you see that playing it out with, with your customers? For the uninitiated, Worldwide Technology has our Advanced Technology Center. It's five physical data centers plus cloud adjacent plus the hyperscalers. And it's, I call it a production test facility. It's nothing but a, a giant proving ground for our customers to come do things, whether it's storage or servers or networking or even our AI proving ground. And so our customers bring us use cases and we can replicate their environment even down to WAN latency. And we can do the testing for them. And when we do that, we give them a report and they'll get comments on usability. And we've talked to customers who, you know, I don't know if you remember back in the day, we had consolidation platforms because then I had less to manage. Customers have shifted away from that to more of a blast zone mentality and when they do that, they say, well, we're okay with managing more if it's easier to manage. That to me is really key because I mean, manageability, because as we said, is that <laughs> people aren't getting storage uh, PhDs. The people aren't, you know, uh, trust me, I go back to, you know, the symmetrics and other stuff and having, you know, done the CLI and been in that and, you know, had my storage PhD and I probably would have lost it by now. But, you know, the manageability and intelligent management tools would seem to be really a, a key to this. And, you know, how does PowerStore really bring that ease of management and those intelligent tools to bear? Yeah, there's a, there's a few core, I mentioned the design principles earlier, uh, but one of them uh, we call dynamic node affinity. I affectionately call it DNA because I think there's a lot of intelligence and, and nice. uh, logic built into there. But DNA or dynamic node affinity, uh, imagine, if you would, creating a volume uh, on a, a dual controller system, which is the, the premise and foundation of PowerStore. If, if I'm creating a volume in days past, and even in, in other vendor technologies today, you have to make a decision. Uh, does, is that volume going to be connected on this node? Is it going to be connected on this node? Um, what if you didn't have to worry about that at all? And what if in the fact that in real time, as I was coming into the infrastructure, if, if I say, as a system, 
I can guarantee you better performance, lower latency if I just flip this back in path and you know nobody cares. What if it did that for you? Well, we've solved the what if, right? <laughs> so like that's that's what DNA is actually doing. It's it's basically guaranteeing to the customer that they're always guaranteed the best optimization, the best performance, and the best balance across the nodes, you know, within the appliance, within the architecture. But then you you take that to another another level on, you know, everybody's worried about business continuity. Uh, disaster recovery. We've seen what's happening with you know hurricanes and you know things like that, where customers are trying to figure out how do they survive certain scenarios. Well, you know, part of what we've done in the implementation of PowerStore is designed the protection aspect around protection policies. So customers, you know, and you've probably seen this in in lab environments where customers will have hundreds or even thousands of of volumes and, and data sets that they're working with. What if I created a policy that created the snapshot schedule, the replication schedule, and not just snapshot and replication, but also fully integrated simultaneous backup integration, right? Click, deploy, go to hundreds or thousands of volumes instantly. That is simplicity, right? That, that's bringing, you know, that, that's the, the rubber meeting the road, so to speak. Yeah. I think it also reduces the margin for error. If, if I take the, the other approach and I say, well, I'm going to I'm going to create scripts or whatever for taking snapshots or replicating things, and I'm going to do it all manually for every volume group or LUN. That's pretty painful, and there's a lot of room for things to go wrong there. A policy is simple. I create it once. It, the interface is really easy, and then I just go and apply that policy to whatever I need to protect. Also, people are looking to understand, you know abstract up. So once you get up above the volume and things like that and kind of, you know, the AI ops, I guess you could say, kind of uh, scenarios because I think part of what I've been hearing over the course of the day is, you know, cybersecurity and being able to understand anomalies is, is one of those things. What else do you see with kind of the AI ops trends? Yeah, the AI ops industry is really interesting because it is giving customers not just an administrator daily task view, it's giving you that upper level, upper echelon view from an executive perspective as well. So you can rapidly generate you know, reports on what's happening in, at the executive level. Hey, my, my boss's boss's boss is asking for what this looks like. Bam, here you go, right? But not only that, the security framework, the anomaly detection, security aspects of things, uh, PowerStore, for example, with, with Dell Technologies, Apex AI Ops, we fully built in and integrated a cybersecurity assessment capability. So we're skimming the, the NIST.gov database for known CVEs, exploits, and saying, hey, um, we just detected that there's a known exploit that is, is open out there in your environment. Here's how you fix it. Here's what you need to do to, to service that and, and get rid of that. So we give them a score in doing that. Not only that, we have anomaly detection capabilities. That could be performance driven or capacity driven. And here's a, a real world example. One of the first attack vectors of ransomware, encrypt, right? Get in and start encrypting data. If you start encrypting data, the data reduction profile is gonna change for that data. So now where the system was writing, I don't know, one gig a day, now it's writing two, three, 20 gig a day. <laughs> you know, the, the, the variable changes. As a result, that's an anomaly. Right? Same for I.O. If somebody kicks off an encryption algorithm or encryption engine on a host that normally runs at 5,000 IOPS and now all of a sudden it's running at 6,000 IOPS, that's a performance anomaly. So being able to detect things you know, in, in real time or near real time and then give the users feedback, given executive level reporting, given visibility of that framework, and then saying, okay, that's, that's the AI ops world, right? but then what about at the array level? You know, We're the only company that I know of it's actually developed and deployed in enterprise storage systems, hardware level root of trust, right? So being able to say, hey, when you download the code, now, true story, I had a customer a couple of weeks ago that said, hey, I noticed between this code version and this code version, uh, there's, there's a time factor that seems to have changed. I'm concerned that could this be malicious code? We go back and say, hey, look, no, we have hardware root of trust. You download a digitally signed instance of that software update from Dell Technologies that joins the Intel chipset, creates this hardware level root of trust, guaranteeing the integrity of that code base. So no, uh, there is no malicious code. Now we can, 
we can go investigate what you're seeing, but it's not malicious code, right? Right, right. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, and, and that must you know, help customers because it's, it's not just about uh, you know, the AI ops and the configuration, but things like upgrades and things like that. That must be a, a lot of where customers are like, we just need this to be simple and starting with things like upgrades. Oh my gosh, upgrades. Upgrades have been a pain for a long time. Um, you know, previously when they were entirely handled by the vendor, you had to, you know, let's say you had a bug and you, you may have a couple weeks before you might be able to get that fixed for all the, the pre-health checks and all that. Now I can go to a website, I can download it, um, and I can upload it to the system, and then within a couple hours, I'm out of it. Um, plus, I could also script all of that so that, you know, there's, the code is what's driving uh, the upgrade of the system. So it's, it's completely hands off, really. It's just single click of a button. Yeah, it's, it's almost like the, the self-driving vehicle, whether, whether it's the software updates or even the hardware updates of being able to say, you know, I need a little more performance. John mentioned earlier, swapping those nodes, saying, hey, uh, I want to go from this level of performance to this level of performance. Boom, done. Hey, I actually need the performance of a whole nother array. Being able to drop that in and scale workloads across multiple appliances and get the benefits of multiple arrays, but yet I'm managing them through the same pane of glass, the same interface. I don't, I don't have to relearn. I don't, back before, in the days of virtualization, you probably remember we, everybody talked about storage sprawl. I mean, a server sprawl, compute sprawl, now it's storage sprawl, right? So you, you've got storage arrays popping up everywhere where now I could have a cluster and manage those simplistically from, from the same place. So, you know, the software updates, hardware updates, they're, they're all really streamlined. Well, I would say even for end of, I call it end of life planning for the system, if for some reason I need to upgrade to something, I need to drop another system and migrate onto it. If I can just bring it into the cluster, pick everything up off of this one and move it over non-disruptively, that takes months of my, that gives me months of my life back. Yeah. What are customers doing to really simplify and optimize their broader environment in this ecosystem and really tie things together? Because it would seem like there's a lot of different, you know, we had, like you said, compute sprawl, storage sprawl, now we have API sprawl yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and things like that. What what is Dell really doing with its partners to help with that? Yeah, that's a it's an interesting perspective given that Dell Technologies is a, a portfolio company and not just a storage portfolio company, but with compute network capabilities. So we do have a very focused better together strategy within our portfolio of data center products. And when you look at what's happening with Say, for example, smart fabrics, storage software, which is some capability that we have with deploying NVMe TCP environments, which uh, John has had a lot of familiarity with. Um, being able to, to really automate the process of deploying, zoning, bringing net new hosts into an environment, which used to be a lot of manual time spent on clicking, provisioning, mapping, zoning, that can all be done seamlessly. So whether it's at you know, deploying software capabilities at the networking layer or even getting into what we're doing with direct backup integration, being able to say, hey, we have this wonderful industry-leading PowerProtect capability with PowerProtect data domain and, and PowerProtect um, data manager in the software stack, but we've built in direct integration from PowerStore to PowerProtect. And at Dell Tech World this year, had several customers come up to me talking about that and said, that's one of the coolest things, those protection policies we mentioned earlier. What if an administrator can just set the policy to say not only replicate this for business continuity, but also want you to back it up, or maybe somebody comes down from legal and says, we got to put this on legal hold, click, click, and I just you know say, hey, put a policy wrapper around that, that I'm going to put that into an archive scenario directly, directly connected, uh, and yet I can put a 70 year retention wrapper around that data. So, you know, looking at it from a software perspective, the backup integration perspective, and then I think as you, as you bring it home, PowerStore, honestly, is, is, it, it kind of ends up being more than a storage array because we can connect to the backup ecosystem. We can connect three tier, you know, to the, the PowerEdge servers of the world and create these 
three-tier context for compute, network, and storage, but even the hyper-converged world, the, the HCI world, the VxRail deployment methodology that Dell Technologies has had out there, you know, industry leader in that arena, there are still, you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of those that are there. What if those customers can leverage PowerStore you know, for their storage and become more agile, more efficient, more expedient with what they're doing. So in any context, right, it, it's delivering. Uh, and then you also have kind of, you know, the DevOpsy type stuff as well. What are you seeing from, from that? Because you're seeing a lot of use cases come to you. You know, things like uh, Terraform and Ansible and a whole bunch of other management features that are out there that Developer are... Developer.dell.com. Right? There you go. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's like, <laughs> yeah. it, it's, all of that is housed in one location for us. So all of that integration with container storage modules, whether Terraform integration, or, oh, I want to do REST API scripts, or, oh, hey, I need to integrate this, you know, into uh, a Kubernetes environment. All of that stuff is there, and I think that's one of the design principles of PowerStore from day one. It was designed to be very open. Uh, so whether that's, you know, plug-in capable, like that, you know, I met with a customer Monday, uh, said, hey, what about ServiceNow integration? I said, but there's a YouTube video for that, right? <laughs> so, uh, and guess what? You know, you can search YouTube for ServiceNow and PowerStore, you'll, you'll see it, you'll find it. Uh, but all of those things, you know, are kind of centered around developer.dell.com because to John's point, uh, we're, we are living in an age where everything is changing so rapidly and going in and, and clicking through an interface is becoming less and less of a thing. It's, hey, I need to play with all of these different environments and we don't ever want to touch the storage array. And that's part of the design practice was that PowerStore would be highly programmable from externalized sources. Again, all of this is just so key to ease of use and also giving people time back, like you said, even the auditing stuff, it definitely all ties together from the manageability down to the optimization inside the actual kit there. So, hey, I want to thank you both for coming on board today. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, time goes quickly on, here on theCUBE and you know, you guys were great guests. So thank you for coming on board. Thank right. you for Thanks having us. Thanks for having us. Yep. And thank you for joining us today on Smarter Storage for Tomorrow's Opportunities on theCUBE, the leader in tech news and analysis. Thank you and see you soon.